Hey guys, I am very, very proud to announce a new series we have here on the Achievement Hunter channel. This is the Great Levels in Gaming. This is a guy named Max Bernard who I met at PAX East a couple years ago, and I've been keeping an eye on his stuff, and we liked it. So we figured, hey, why not give him a better platform to show off his really, really cool videos. So check out this first video. It's completely different from anything we've ever really done on Achievement Hunter. I'm a big fan of it. I hope you are too. Please let us know in the comments below. And um, yeah, so enjoy first episode of Great Levels in Gaming. The elites are blind, Arbiter, but I will make them see. Hi, my name is Max, and welcome to Great Levels in Gaming. Today I want to take a look at one of my favorite moments in Halo 2, playing as the Arbiter for the first time in the stages The Arbiter and The Oracle. They both take place on the same Forerunner gas mine, so I really consider them to be two halves of the same level, and if I had to guess, I'd say that Bungie probably split the mission in two to avoid having a loading screen right in the middle of a level. For the sake of clarity, for the rest of the video, I'll refer to the gas mine itself as the level, and the Arbiter and the Oracle as the two stages that comprise it. Also, this video does go into spoiler territory, so keep that in mind if you haven't played Halo 2. But that's enough housekeeping, let's get to the good stuff. Now, in order to understand why I love this level so much, we have to backtrack a little bit and take a brief look at the first Halo game, which was the game that made me really fall in love with first-person shooters. Before the release of Halo 2, my friends and I would spend hours playing the first game's co-op campaign, fighting the Covenant's forces and the monstrous Flood Parasite. Once we learned that Halo 2 would finally let us use some of the Covenant's most powerful weapons, like the Fuel Rod Gun, the Wraith Artillery Tank, and to me, most importantly, the iconic Energy Sword, we couldn't have been more stoked for the game to come out. What we didn't expect, though, was that we'd get to use these weapons in the hands of a member of the Covenant. I can't speak for you, but none of the previews that I saw for the game made any mention that we'd be playing as the Arbiter, a high-ranking Covenant elite, so I was a bit confused when the game opened with his trial. When I first saw him turn on his energy sword upon being sent to attack a group of heretical Covenant defectors, though, I just lost it. This is one of my favorite instances of a game developer totally delivering on my hype, even managing to deliver on hype I didn't know I had. I didn't realize how badly I had wanted to play as a Covenant character or use the Sentinel Beam weapon until I was doing it. One of the first things you'll notice about this level is its environmental design, which is very tight, almost claustrophobic. This serves as contrast to the more open levels that come before and after it, which I feel brings a welcome degree of variety to the gameplay, avoiding monotony. As much as I love the huge scale of Metropolis and Delta Halo, the levels that bookend the Arbiter and the Oracle, having the same massive scale all the time could get stale, and I feel like these stages benefit from their smaller size for a number of reasons, even beyond just keeping the gameplay varied. We start to see these benefits when we consider this level as an introduction to both the Arbiter and the Energy Sword. From a gameplay standpoint, the only mechanical difference between the Arbiter and the returning protagonist, the Master Chief, is that instead of a flashlight, the Arbiter can make himself invisible using active camouflage. You could find power-ups in the first game that would briefly cloak you, but having the ability on hand at any time is a completely different experience since you can leverage it more frequently to flank your enemies. This is where the environmental design comes into play. The tight quarters of the gas mine require you to get fairly close to your enemies while sneaking around them, and this does a couple of really cool things. First, it helps you to define the limits of your invisibility. Some of your enemies also use this ability, and you're able to just barely see them, sometimes thanks to the telltale glow from some of the Covenant's weapons. That being the case, you would be forgiven for thinking that your enemies might be able to do the same while you're cloaked. Because the environments force you to get close to your enemies while invisible, however, you're able to figure out through experience that they won't notice you unless you actually bump into them. All you're told about this ability is that you can go invisible and only for a limited time. The cramped environments do the rest, helping you to learn the ins and outs of the ability, and importantly, they do so without the need for a tutorial. By not using a tutorial, Bungie avoids breaking our immersion and shows respect for our intelligence as players, trusting us to figure this out on our own. I also feel that the close quarters environments make stealth a much more engaging experience than it would be in a larger space. Since you're trying to avoid detection, the last thing you want to do is get close to your enemies for the fear that you might give away your position by bumping into them or failing to get out of their line of sight before your cloak's timer expires. This is often easier said than done in the gas mine's tight hallways, which keeps the tension high as you sneak about, especially on the game's more punishing difficulties. This tension is likely to hold your focus, leading to greater engagement and immersion by literally intensifying the gameplay. 
This is important in any game, but particularly here considering the new character Bungie wanted you to identify with. Not only is the Arbiter a very high-ranking member of the Covenant, who take very seriously their mission to exterminate humanity, but in the game's opening cutscene we're actually told that he was the commander of all the Covenant's forces in the first game. Not exactly a likable dude taken at face value. So I feel that this tension you feel when playing as him, that concern for his and thereby your safety, plays a big part in making him a relatable character, at least for me. I love that the gameplay here did so much to get me invested in this character, despite his initially steadfast allegiance to the Covenant. These same environments that make the cloak useful for stealth also give you room to practice using it in open combat. The easy access to cover where you can let your camo recharge gives you plenty of opportunities to use it for flanking, opening up new tactics that become especially useful when playing with a friend. For example, one player can draw focus while the other uses their cloak to sneak around behind the enemy. I find that this is just as engaging as the tense stealth gameplay, but in open combat the engagement comes from the opportunities to make creative use of your invisibility. Especially on the harder difficulties, you'll probably find yourself actively scanning the rooms thinking about how you can make the best use of your active camo. The close quarters and active camo also make this level, in my opinion, a near perfect training ground for the energy sword. You can briefly use it at the tail end of Metropolis, the level that precedes these, but you can only get it for the last few moments and it's very easy to miss. How easy? Well, when I went to record this clip it took about a half hour of replaying this checkpoint before I could finally coax this elite into pulling the damn thing out. As such, the Arbiter and the Oracle are the first two stages in Halo 2 in which you can get any extended time with the energy sword, so I feel that this is where Bungie intended for us to figure out how it works. There are swords readily available throughout the gas mine, and not only are you frequently in their optimal range, but the mine's tightest corridors set you up to figure out the sword's limits simply through experience. You see, for a weapon that will almost always kill you in one hit, the energy sword has a surprising number of limits when in your hands. Grunts can be killed in a single hit, but the elites present, depending on difficulty, can teach you that you can't always rely on the sword's lunge to be a one-hit kill. In particular, the tightest hallways increase the likelihood that you'll try to use the sword on an enemy from point-blank range, especially when you're sneaking about. At this point you would discover that the lunge gets replaced by a weaker slash attack when you're right up against an enemy. Finally, you're likely to use the sword against the Flood when they show up in the second stage since they frequently charge at you, at which point you'll find that it makes them shatter on impact. Not only is this really satisfying visual feedback, it also prevents the little infection forms from bringing the dead combat forms back to life like you see here. What's really cool to me across all this is that Halo 2 tells you nothing about how to use the sword, instead giving you two stages that allow you to learn almost all of its capabilities simply through experimentation and experience. The combination of active camouflage and the energy sword encourage you to engage with the environment around you, figuring out how best to attack your enemies, and I feel that this engagement makes a notable difference when fighting the Flood. For me, fighting them in the first game would often lead to backpedaling in order to keep them in shotgun range without letting them get close enough to smack me. The addition of the energy sword and the Arbiter's active camo allow for more freedom of movement, allowing you to sneak around or between them while invisible before diving in with a sword lunge. I found that these expanded close range options encouraged me to think about the environment around me to a greater degree than I did in the first game, thinking about objects around me rather than just behind me, making me engage with the space in which I was fighting the Flood. With the sword covering close combat, I also find the Sentinel Beam to be a very satisfying addition to the arsenal by finally providing a reliable long range option against the Flood. Just like it does with the sword, the level provides a near constant supply of the weapon so that you have ample opportunity to get a feel for it. Worth noting is that this makes complete sense in the context of the story as well, since the Forerunners created the Sentinels in part to deal with the Flood. On a lesser note, these were actually the first two stages in the Halo series not to contain any human weapons, so you never have to worry about the Flood toting rocket launchers, which were pretty much the bane of my existence in the first game. Beyond just the gameplay, I also want to look at what I think these stages do well to get the ball rolling on the Arbiter's story and characterization, especially for those of us who had already played the first game. This starts from the very first moments of these stages, as the Arbiter starts with a sword in hand. Series veterans may recall from the first game that only very high-ranking elites wield the energy sword, and new players can make the same association from the Elite Ultra at the end of the previous level, so starting this level with it equipped underscores just how much of a badass this character is. Toward the end of the level we also get this shot, which references a similar shot from the first game, establishing a parallel between the Master Chief and the Arbiter. 
Not only is this a fun reference for returning players, it also suggested to me that the two characters might not be as different as they initially appear, foreshadowing their eventual alliance. Finally, the last cutscene in the Oracle continues to develop the brewing conflict between the Arbiter and Tartarus, this hammer-wielding Hulk who leads the Brutes, that comes to a head in the game's final moments. The thing is, all of that could have been done in a different level, and when you think about the game in a big picture sense, the biggest lasting effect this level has on the story is probably the reintroduction of 343 Guilty Spark, referred to by the Covenant as the Oracle. To me, this begs the question, why center this level on the Heretic Leader, a character who is introduced at its start, is dead by its end, and isn't mentioned again for the rest of the game? I feel that the answer lies in the level's frequent leveraging of the theme of sight, and, in turn, perception. These come in the form of the heretic leader's frequent allusions to sight and blindness, using phrasing such as open your eyes and the elites are blind, as well as his use of holodromes, which create a holographic copy of himself. To me, these call attention to the fact that the Arbiter, and the rest of the Covenant, are blind to the true purpose of the Halo Rings, which is to wipe out all sentient life in the galaxy. By highlighting what the Arbiter doesn't know and repeatedly referencing Sight, specifically its restoration, I feel that this provides a clue to the fact that the Arbiter will eventually learn the truth later in the game. To me, this solidifies the Heretic Leader's role in the story as the Arbiter's foil, highlighting his failings to foreshadow the coming growth of his character over the course of the game. In my opinion, this makes the Heretic Leader one of the most interesting and important characters not just in Halo 2, but the entire series. So what we have is a level with gameplay that contrasts against the open levels that bookend it, and which uses that more confined gameplay to properly introduce both the Arbiter's active camo and the Energy Sword. Additionally, it takes the opportunity to reintroduce the Flood, using the other freshly introduced mechanics to create a more engaging and thoughtful experience than you might have had in the first game. On top of all that, it establishes the Arbiter as a character and sets up his entire story arc, which personally is my favorite part of Halo 2's campaign. Finally, I'd be guilty of heresy myself if I failed to mention the Grunt Birthday Party skull hidden in these levels, which, for reasons you'll see in a moment, is my favorite game modifier in the series. As far as Halo levels go, I think the likes of the Silent Cartographer and Assault on the Control Room probably get more attention, but I'd say that the Arbiter and the Oracle deserve a spot right up there with the rest of the Halo Elite. Thanks for watching, I hope you've enjoyed this look at some of the level design in Halo 2. A big thanks to Jack and Jeff for helping me to share this with you, and to my longtime friend Lee for helping me capture the split-screen footage. I hope you'll join me next time to take a look at another great level in gaming.